<laughs> All right, the Hangout is now live on air. We are excited to have our seminar speaker today, Dr. Sarah Ballard. She is the Carl Sagan Fellow at the University of Washington in the Astrophysics Department there. She has her undergraduate degree in astrophysics from the University of California at Berkeley and her PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard University. Uh, we're very excited to have her here. Uh, this seminar series is supported by a grant from the University of Central Arkansas Foundation and Dr. Ballard's seminar is entitled Choose Your Own Adventure, Multiplicity of Planets Among the Smallest Stars. So take it away for us, Dr. Ballard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Will. I wanted to introduce one other person who's in the room with me, who's a middle schooler who's shadowing me today. That's Amy. Uh, so now she's going to have a lot of fame and fortune having been on YouTube. Um, so let me go ahead and pan to my talk. Can you all see that OK? Yes. OK, wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you again for the invitation. I'm really gratified to be able to share with you my work. Um, folks in the room might recognize this image. Kids who were raised in the 90s sort of recall Choose Your Own Adventure fondly as being from our own childhood. And the reason why I'm drawing on it is to speak about a bimodality in the blueprint for planets uh, in the Milky Way. It's something that I've been working on over the past few months with a colleague and friend, uh, John Johnson, a professor at Harvard University. So to walk you through the content of the talk, first I want to talk about exoplanets generally. Um, this is a field which has evolved in a way that has been very unexpected, particularly a few aspects of it. Um, and it. And I think my own career is reflective of that. As a graduate student and early into my postdoctoral career, I was focusing my attention upon individual planetary systems. I'll sort of start with those. What we can learn from placing individual planets under a microscope. Um, and I've taken a different path more recently and with this work that I'll tell you about, which is more of a wide field lens. What, what is typical uh, in the universe? I'm going to focus my study on M dwarfs. This is a uh, nomenclature, astronomical nomenclature for the smallest stars. These are anything half the mass of the sun and smaller. There's a reason why I'm focusing my study on these objects. And if you've overheard anything about exoplanets in the recent few years, you've heard an emphasis on these particular stars. Um, I wanted to communicate why that should be the case, especially being that we orbit a star which is much larger. Uh, and in the course of this talk, I'll answer the question about what a typical exoplanetary architecture in the universe is. By architecture, I mean the whole stellar system blueprint, the um, nature of the central star, the types of planets that go around that star, and their configuration. And I'll conclude uh, with a roadmap to the remote detection of life, so trying to contextualize these results in the overall trajectory of, I think, where we're headed uh, in the field of exoplanets in the next 10 years. So starting with, generally, um, where we've been going in exoplanets, I want to showcase a few key results to communicate exactly what it is that we can know about these worlds, even though they're located often hundreds of light years uh, away from the Earth. So this is a star which is um, very close to Earth. This is our own sun. This image was gathered over a series of 13 hours by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see that there are several dynamic features of this image. So not only do you see that dot crossing the face of our host star, which is the planet Venus, you can also see a hint of the star rotating. So our own star um, rotates with a, with a rotational period of about one month. And you can also see stellar activity on the surface corresponding to our star's um, magnetic cycle. So this is capturing a singular event in 2012 when Venus uh, occulted the sun from the point of view of the Solar Dynamics Observatory and from Earth. Um, so I didn't see this event in real time. I watched it on the video monitor because it was so cloudy in Cambridge that day. Um, but it was captured all the same. What's interesting is to imagine that Venus is casting a shadow on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Even if you took this starlight and moved it infinitely far away so that all of the light from the star was falling onto a single pixel, 
you would no longer be able to independently resolve the existence of a planet and yet you could infer its presence because our star would look some tiny fraction dimmer for some small part of the time. So for example, if we were alien creatures looking in at Earth, every 365 days the sun would grow dimmer by tens of parts per million for about 10 hours. So this did not used to be the most fruitful way of finding planets, but it has become the most fruitful way of finding planets since NASA's Kepler mission was launched. So this is a spacecraft uh, which was launched in 2009. It's in an Earth trailing orbit, unlike the Hubble telescope which orbits the Earth every 90 days. The Kepler, the Kepler telescope is trailing planet Earth like a dog on a leash. And, and like the Hubble telescope which points to different parts of the sky to, absorb, uh, to observe different phenomena, Kepler has affixed its gaze on one part of the sky uh, in, in an unflinching fashion. It did not look away from one particular footprint on the sky for about four years, turning only to downlink the data back to Earth. What I'm showing here is the um, projection of the Kepler field of view onto the northern sky. It's overhead at about midnight in the summer. It's the size of your outstretched hand when held at arm's length. So this is showing the Kepler footprint close the array of CCDs that make up the focal plane. Uh, highlighted in yellow, you can see toward the upper right, um, is a star called Tres 2. Before the launch of the Kepler mission, this was the only star in the Kepler field of view that we knew hosted a planet. The planet Tres 2b is a hot Jupiter. So because Kepler is in an Earth trailing orbit, we couldn't have the bandwidth to download these full frame images. Rather, 150,000 stars were pre-selected to be cut down into postage stamps of a 10 pixels or so and sent back down to the Earth. All of the stars that Kepler examined lie in this particular part of the sky. And you can see why for a transit survey you simply can't move your gaze um, because you might miss this uh, very important transit event that enables you to infer the presence of a planet. So this is what we knew before the launch of the Kepler mission. And as of 2013, um, these are the locations of stars that we know host planets. Dennis Overby, the science writer of the New York Times, referred to this as the Skittles diagram. Um, and what you can see is twofold. First, the ubiquity of planets really jumps out at you. You can see that it wasn't the case that the only reason we saw Tres 2 there was because there weren't other planets there. Rather, we simply hadn't looked for long enough and in a sensitive enough fashion. The other thing you notice about this plot is the color coding of these different skittles. Um, they correspond to the size of the planets that Kepler uncovered. So rather than these Jupiter-sized planets, which are shown in red, being the most common in the universe, by far more, more common by orders of magnitude are small planets. So this is showing um, things which are in particular, green in size are the most populous in the universe. These are things between one and two times the size of the Earth. Um, and there is no solar system analog for these things. Um, my colleague Leslie Rogers likes to say that there are 80% of the planets in the universe and yet 0% of the planets in the solar system. This is only one way in which exoplanets are a unique laboratory to, to study planetary phenomena. Um, so I'll sort of showcase the exquisite precision of Kepler with the story of one particular planet. So this is showing to scale an Earth-sized planet transiting a sun-like star. The arrow is pointing to it. So you can imagine just how hard it would be to create a photometer sensitive enough to notice a decrement of 100 uh, photons per million. This is actually a real planet uh, called Kepler-93. What I'm showing here is the transit light curve, the brightness of the star as a function of time, centered on the time of transit plus or minus a few hours. So when this planet, about one and a half times the size of the Earth, occults its host star, it casts a shadow on this Kepler telescope that takes a particular shape. You can see that when the planet is passing on to the limb of the star, it occults only some of the light, approaching the maximum depth when the planet is completely um, within the stellar disk. So what I want to draw your attention to is the y-axis of this figure. Every time this planet transits, it blocks 218 photons out of every million. 
from reaching the Kepler telescope. Because this planet has such a short orbital period, and because it was one of the brightest stars in the Kepler field, it's one of the best known transit light curves in existence, one of the best characterized transit light curves. Because of our independent knowledge of the star, we know that when the planet transits, again, 218 photons per million are blocked, plus or minus one photon. That's how well we've measured the size of that disk projected onto the star. But the question, of course, isn't only the amount of light which is blocked by the star. In order to know the intrinsic properties of the planet, you have to know those of the star. This is why fully two-thirds of papers resulting from the Kepler mission have not been about planets at all, but have been about stars. The cadence of some of the Kepler stars, namely one observation taken per minute, enables you to see stars being distorted in real time due to astroseismology. So seismic waves propagating inside stars produce particular standing patterns that are similar to the spherical harmonics. And based on the distortion of the star, you can actually see the star getting dimmer and brighter on this characteristic time scale, which enables you, just like with any um, sound speed, enables you to probe the interior of the gas through which that sound wave is propagating. So we were able to measure the intrinsic size of the star using astroseismology to plus or minus 1%. Because we know how much light the planet blocks so exquisitely from the light curve, this translated more or less to the same error budget on the size of the planet, plus or minus 1%. For a planet the size of the Earth, this is about 74 miles. It's the equivalent of knowing the height of a person to half an inch from the surface of the Earth. And this is the best measurement we have of a planet outside of the solar system, by far the most precise. But what's the point of such a measurement? You know, it's, it's incredible to showcase the precision which is, in, which is possible with an, with an exquisite instrument like Kepler, but to what end? What we're really curious about in this part of mass and radius space, so this is showing planetary mass on the x-axis uh, and planetary radius on the y-axis. You can see toward the bottom right corner are Venus and Earth. The entire swath of blue that appears is fully unknown planetary physics to us, for which there is nothing in the solar system. You'll notice that planetary radii in this plot only go up to about three times the radius of the Earth. The next largest thing to Earth in our own solar system is Neptune, four times the radius of the Earth. All of the other things that you see there, the other objects, are exoplanets. Kepler-93 lies right in the middle uh, of this figure, which was produced by Courtney Dressing. And what she showed is, based on really exquisite radius and follow-up mass measurements for rocky planets, there appears to be a very well-defined recipe for rocky planets, which coincides with the compositions of Venus and the Earth. This is taking only a subselection of planets for which we know the mass exquisitely well. There are some other mysterious things um, which appear to be less dense, and perhaps those evolved in a different fashion. So there's a reason why one might lavish an incredible amount of follow-up attention on a very small number of planets. And yet, as you saw on that diagram, there are thousands of planets that have been uncovered by Kepler. The amount of resources human power it takes to follow up a single Kepler planet with the exquisition that I followed up with the um, exquisiteness that I followed up Kepler 93 is not tenable. Um, so we pick individual planets. There's another reason to put planets under a microscope which is to reveal complete planetary architectures. This was the first planet discovery that I ever undertook. It's for a planet called Kepler-19. I'm showing here again that transit um, light curve. So now this is something which is, uh, again, about two times the radius uh, of the Earth. What's most interesting about this planet is that it didn't appear perfectly like clockwork. Rather, when I tried to create a model to the phase transit light curve, it looked more like this. You can see when phased to a perfect linear ephemeris that especially during the times when the planet is passing onto the limb of the star and off the limb of the star, the model is quite poor. The residuals, uh, the photometric residuals in the bottom showing the difference between the best fit model and the data show that those times of ingress and egress are a very poor fit. And indeed, this is because the planet is not appearing in a clock-like fashion. 
Rather, it appears five minutes too early and five minutes too late in a sinusoidal pattern. This was the first time that a transiting planet had been used to infer the presence of another planet altogether. It's planet detection using transit timing variations. So this signature of appearing five minutes too late and five minutes too early is intriguing in that it indicates the presence of a mysterious companion. The physical solution was degenerate. So there were a number of possible planets which could explain the perturbation on the planet that transited. It was only with a three-year follow-up campaign with the premier radial velocity instrument on Earth that the identity of this planet has ultimately been revealed. Um, the best way to measure the plan uh, planet's mass that humankind has so far uh, is with a radial velocity instrument called HARPS. This is actually looking for the physical motion of the star in space being gravitationally tugged by a planet. Because it's a gravitational signature, it enables you to uncover the planet's mass. It's only in combination with the mass and radius measurement of a transiting planet that you can deduce something about its bulk density and conclude whether or not it's rocky. And then finally, there's been a reason to observe individual planetary systems from the point of view of whether they might host life. So these are showing a couple of spectra in K-band, which is an infrared part of the spectrum which is visible through Earth's atmosphere, of two small stars, in particular these M-dwarf stars. Uh, the top is a, is a planet that I focused on called Kepler-61. It hosts an uh, Earth-sized planet two times the radius of the Earth, in fact, um, residing in its star's habitable zone. The bottom figure is a spectrum in the same part of wavelength space of a very nearby star whose radius has been directly measured from interferometry, which is to say the star is not a point source when measured with interferometry. We know its exact extent on the sky in an angular sense and are able to deduce its physical size. So it's it required some creativity to characterize planets as well. Planets around small stars are very hard to characterize because small stars are very complex. In this case, I leveraged our understanding with minimal um, reliance on, on physical models to um, bootstrap my way into understanding the star uh, that hosts the planet better. And this is something that I've undertaken with a campaign from the ground at University of Washington's Apache Point Observatory uh, with which I this is showing here David, Megan, and Jesse, um, who have worked on different planets um, for which we've gathered data at Apache Point. So this is an update um, of the planetary census of planets that orbit stars other than the Sun. This was released in 2013. This is showing the relative size of the stars in their planets, which appear as dots on the surface of the, of the star. I want to draw your attention now to the size distribution of these stars. So this is taking sort of a cutout of the census. In comparison, Jupiter transiting the Sun on the same scale is shown above. Jupiter transiting the Sun would lie about four-fifths of the way up from the bottom on that transit census. That's because the vast majority of stars that have been uncovered to host planets by the Kepler mission are smaller than the Sun. This was probably one of our first surprises launching Kepler. These planets are intrinsically easier to detect because the same size planet produces a fractionally larger shadow, but even accounting for this geometric effect, we've uncovered something very intriguing and it's caused folks who are interested in planets to focus their study on M-dwarfs, the really smallest of the stars. This is a figure from 2012 that shows why these small stars are so interesting to us. Let me walk you through it. This is showing planet occurrence on the y-axis, so number of planets per star interior to a particular orbital period, in this case 50 days. This was using data after Kepler had been launched um, and was still well into taking data on the nominal mission, versus stellar effective temperature. The Sun is shown with that dotted line right there. So before the launch of the Kepler mission, transit surveys had uncovered that about one out of every hundred sun-like stars hosted a planet. If you look at the colors of these different lines, they correspond to different planetary sizes. The blue line at the very bottom corresponds to Jovian planets. And indeed, you can see for every sun-like star 
there's about 0.01 Jupiter-sized planets interior to 50 days. So it wasn't that planets were intrinsically rare, which is what folks were wondering before the launch of the Kepler mission. Is it really the case that only one in a hundred stars hosts a Jupiter? Rather, it's the case that the vast majority of fruit were not these low-hanging fruit that were the hot Jupiters. So the one thing that's interesting is that most planets are smaller than that. The other thing that's so intriguing is the dependence of planet occurrence for the smallest planets, that is those between two and four Earth radii that were considered in this analysis, as a function of the effective temperature of the star. Along the top of this diagram you can see um, the nomenclature of the stars going from M0 to F2, these are corresponding to stellar effective temperature you can see on the bottom where M0 is the coolest kind of star and the number above that is showing the number of stars that Kepler observed. So reorienting your eye to where I put that dotted line, you can see that this was a mission which was particularly tuned to address the question of planet frequency around sun-like stars. It observed only a thousand uh, small stars that were considered in this analysis for every 30,000 uh, stars like the Sun. And yet, these small stars seem to host small planets in greatest profusion. This was probably one of the biggest surprises that folks found after the launch of the Kepler mission. Even though the mission was launched to determine the frequency of planets orbiting Sun-like stars, it turns out that the question to address uh, in terms of planets is related to M dwarfs uh, singularly and not sun-like stars even though we ourselves orbit a sun-like star. So this is showing the stellar neighborhood to emphasize why M dwarfs are interesting it's not only that they host small planets in greatest profusion they themselves are the most ubiquitous in the universe so this is showing nearby stars identified from uh, a group at Georgia State uh, the Recons group the color coding here is showing the stellar temperature. So the sun is in the center. The numbers on these different dots are corresponding to the number of bodies associated with that dot. So for example, the 9P at the center is corresponding to the sun and the eight planets. You can see that there's a lot of binaries. But what um, is most immediately affecting when you look at this image is the profusion of red dots. That's because 75% of stars in the Milky Way are small stars. Even though these are the vast majority of stars in the universe, you can't see a single one with your naked eye. If you could see in the infrared, where these stars glow most brightly, then for every star you see in the night sky, seven or more should appear adjacent to it that are these small stars. So combining the raw occurrence rate of planets around small stars and their existence in the universe, especially in our solar neighborhood. A graduate student, Courtney Dressing, um, inferred in early 2013 that with 95% confidence, there's an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of a small star within six parsecs. The radius of the circle I'm showing you is 10 parsecs. So it must be, statistically, one of the stars that you're seeing. In order to really characterize that planet to know its bulk density, though, it has to transit. And in order to accrue enough geometric probability for the transit to occur, you have to expand that bubble to 31 parsecs. And yet this is in our solar backyard. It might have been the case that the frequency of Earth-sized planets, especially those transiting in their stellar habitable zones, would be so low that you could only expect a few per galaxy. But that's not the case. It's probably right next door. So I got really interested in thinking about planets around small stars, in particular whether they occurred in a type of blueprint that's similar to that of the solar system. This is by far the blueprint we're most familiar with. It's one of multiplicity and coplanarity. So this is showing the orbits uh, out to Neptune in our own solar system. All of the planets in the solar system are aligned with one another um, with a difference of only a few degrees. So it paints a consistent picture of how we formed from a circumstellar disk and haven't been scattered very much below or above that disk. And there's also a large number of planets around the star, the Sun. Now I want to zoom in interior to the orbit of Mars. So this is showing to scale the orbits of the rocky planets in the solar system. Kepler is also sensitive to multiple systems of planets 
if those planets also transit. What I'm showing here is a small sample of the multiply transiting systems that have been uncovered by Kepler. You can see that they're much more dynamically packed than the solar system. In particular, I'd like to consider one planetary system. This is Kepler-186. This is showing the individual folded transits of all five planets that transit in this system. For five planets to transit, the system has to be extremely coplanar. And indeed, it's very similar to our own Sun. So comparing these two systems in terms of their, their bulk properties, you have the Sun, one Earth radii, and one, um, one stellar radii, and one stellar mass, versus Kepler-186, about half the extent of the Sun and about half of its mass. It's much cooler than the Sun, but in terms of the ensemble properties of planets, they're similar. Kepler-186 has at least five planets, at least one residing in the star's habitable zone, and these are aligned within eight degrees, which they must be in order for all of the planets to transit. This is showing a schematic of those planetary views. So what you can see is that the Kepler-186 planets are much closer in to the host star than planets in the solar system. Because this is such a small star, it emits much less light. More of that light is also in the infrared. So the habitable zone, which is shown in that green shaded region, resides much closer in to the host star. This is yet another reason why, if you are interested in studying planets in the universe, it is most interesting to look at small stars. So not only do small planets occur most often around small stars, not only are small stars the most profuse in the universe, but because their systems are so much more dynamically packed Individual planets are likelier to transit, and with the Kepler mission, you're getting a much more complete picture of the full planetary system than you are with a system that's much more spaced out, like the solar system, where you can expect a lot less of those planets to transit from geometric probability. So I got interested asking, what is a typical exoplanetary architecture in the universe? By which I mean, what is a typical exoplanetary architecture around an M dwarf, since that's a more than typical star? Uh, it works in the following fashion. So I'm showing here the silicon eye of Kepler on the right hand side, affixing its gaze on a small star. Let's say that this star hosts three planets, but only two of them transit because of some scatter and mutual inclination. One could still deduce from the ensemble findings of Kepler, the true number of planets per star in their mutual inclination. This is not the first time that a, that a study of this nature has been undertaken. So Fang and Margot at UCLA addressed this for solar type stars. What they concluded is that you need at least one to two planets per star, almost aligned with one another within three degrees in order to explain the yield of planets from the Kepler mission. Dan Fabricki at the University of Chicago addressed the question of uh, coplanarity in a different fashion by looking at the transit duration. The amount of time that it takes the planet to sweep across the face of the star should depend on the cord that it's crossing. This allows you to probe how coplanar individual planets are. What I got most interested in, though, is what I just described those systems of planets orbiting the smallest stars. Because they're much closer in and likelier to transit, you're sensitive to the more complete architecture, which Jonathan Swift found extrapolating from a single planetary system and comparing it to the full yield of Kepler planets is that you need at least five planets per star. I got curious asking whether the picture was more complicated than this. What I'm showing is a histogram of the number of stars which host n planets, where n runs between 1 and 5. This is only for the small stars, and this is the entirety of the data set that I use to conduct this analysis. Both of the stars hosting five planets I've already mentioned, one of those is Kepler-186, that M dwarf hosting five planets, and the other is Kepler-32. The vast majority of stars which have been uncovered to host planets with Kepler host only one planet. It is these particular stars that show only one transit signal that are the most susceptible to being false positives, namely perhaps there's an additional eclipsing binary, a set of eclipsing stars that are overlapping with the um, Kepler host star in the same pixel. 
but the light is diluted, leading you to think that perhaps it's planetary in nature. And yet, a fourth reason why it's interesting to look at the M dwarfs is because they've had by far the most telescope time lavished upon them. Every single one of these stars has adaptive optics imaging, enabling you to see very close in to the host star to determine whether there could be that putative binary um, lurking close by. They all have spectra in the optical and near infrared by which uh, an additional binary might also show up. In any case, I conservatively could say there's a 10% false positive rate. That's probably much closer to zero. 10% reflects the false positive rate of the Kepler sample as a whole. What about incompleteness? Yet another reason, the fifth reason, why it's useful to do this survey around M dwarfs is because the stars are so much smaller, you're sensitive to the smallest planets. So the average signal to noise of a two Earth radius planet transiting an M dwarf is 10 per transit. Whereas if you're looking at a Sun like star, the signal is much smaller. There might be additional transiting planets that are still lurking in the noise. With M dwarfs, we can be sure, because of the diminutive stature of the stars, that any planet that transits was detected. I call this data set M. So this is the only slide in which I'll show an equation. Um, the problem is simply stated, and yet the result is very intriguing. We have in hand this data set M. It's a vector with five points. The number of planets uh, running between one and five, uh, the number of stars that host that many planets. So what I asked is, how likely is what we observed? Given a universe where there are n planets per star, true number of planets per star, and these have some scatter sigma in their mutual inclinations. So I'm producing synthetic universes that are governed by only two properties, n and sigma, and asking how must n and sigma behave in order to reproduce the m that we see. I codified this in a Bayesian framework. It's a Poisson likelihood of getting m sub i multis compared to what we expect given n and sigma. In order to quantify what we might expect, I used an empirical analysis. I quantified our expectations for what a given universe should look like, what a synthetic Kepler should have found, looking at these synthetic universes as a function of n and sigma uh, in the following fashion. So this is showing a planetary system which lies at one end of this parameter space. For each n and sigma, I drew a set of planets in a Monte Carlo fashion, uniformly in log period from 1 to 200 days. The flat distribution in log period of planets is something which has been observed empirically by Dan Foreman Mackey from the Kepler sample as a whole. I drew mutual inclinations from a Rayleigh distribution with a sigma that I was drawing from this parameter space. I discarded the iteration of Hill stability failed for any two planets, namely I required that the systems be dynamically stable and any two planets that were too close to one another didn't provide a physical scenario that I ought to compare to the real data. And I made some simplifying assumptions, namely that this, the planets were on circular orbits, although I relaxed that um, particular requirement later to address the question of eccentricity. Planets have a radius of two Earth masses and a mass of ten Earth masses. The reason why this mattered, uh, the assumption matters, is for the Hill stability calculation and for the detection probability. I assert that all transiting planets in this synthetic universe were detected. And then I observed them with fake Keplers from a variety of random inclination angles and then asked what should the synthetic Kepler yield be and how does it compare to the one that we observed in truth. So this is showing a system with a high number of planets and a low mutual inclination. As you dial the mutual inclination up, you start seeing things that we haven't seen in reality. We haven't detected systems like this, but perhaps they exist. Then on the other hand, you can have systems with a low number of planets with a high amount of mutual inclination. There is reason to believe that there's a physical motivation at the bracketing ends of this parameter space. The solar system has a high number of planets with a low mutual inclination, whereas hot Jupiter systems tend to have a small number of planets very highly inclined to one another, probably reflecting a violent uh, formation and evolution. So bringing us back to this histogram, so this is that same histogram, the number of planets per star uh, from 1 to 5, 
And now I'll overplot uh, another figure on the bottom, which is going to show contours of the posterior distribution in N and sigma. So the y-axis is showing number of planets per star. The x-axis is showing the scatter in their mutual inclination that are likeliest given what we've observed. So if I assume one mode of planet formation and attempt to fit to all of the data, you can observe two things. The first is that in that top panel, the red swath of parameter space is showing the models which are preferred with one sigma certainty. The dark red is showing two sigma certainty. The best fit model really over predicts the number of doubly transiting planets transiting systems that we see and under predicts the number of singles. So not only is this one mode model a poor fit to the data, it also looks like a part of parameter space that we haven't observed planets to reside in. So on the bottom is showing the one and two sigma confidence contours in posterior space for these two probabilities. You can see that really high mutual inclinations are required and really high numbers of planets. We haven't observed anything like this, but I think the stronger motivation to arguing that something else must be going on is that it simply doesn't look like the data that we have observed. So, but if I fit to only the systems hosting two or more planets, now you get a great fit. It's almost as if systems hosting only one planet, something else is happening. So if you look at systems with two or more transiting planets, they're well replicated by a model with a single mode of planet formation, and those posteriors overlap with the solar system. You need a relatively modest mutual inclination and a high number of planets, at least five. So what I chose to do at this point, myself and John Johnson, was invoke a mixture model. It's the simplest possible mixture model where there are two modes of planet formation. The first mode of planet formation is reflected by that um, synthetic production of planets, which I showed a few slides ago, where you have n planets per star. And these are arranged in some um, mutual inclination codified by sigma. These occur 1 minus f fraction of the time. The other fraction of the time, something else is happening to produce a population of singly transiting planets. It's, a, it's modeled as a delta function at the number of transiting planets equal to 1. What I was interested in then are the posteriors now on n, sigma, and f. What fraction of excess singly transiting planets are necessary to explain the Kepler yield? Now, whether or not those singly transiting systems are appearing because there are less planets residing around those stars because those stars produced less planets or because they met their end in some violent fashion either with planet-planet collisions, ejections, or being dragged into the host star or whether they're simply more highly mutually inclined is uncertain. So this is going back to a mode of planet formation fit to all the multi-transiting planet systems ad hoc invoking this population of singly transiting systems, you get a much better fitting model as you will anytime you invoke a delta function. What's most interesting is that you get a part of parameter space now which is consistent with the mutual inclinations we know to be true from the transit duration ratio. What I said before about the chords uh, that those planets are tracing out when they cross their host stars. But these are showing the marginalized posteriors uh, for what has to be necessary in order to reproduce um, the Kepler yield that we see. So some fraction of the time in the bottom right hand side you can see 50 percent of the time roughly speaking you get systems that require at least five planets and these are very close to being coplanar to one another with a most likely mutual inclination of two degrees. The other half the time something else is happening hence the kind of choose your own adventure title. So a reason why I said the MDORFs were most interesting is because they had had a huge amount of observational resources lavished upon them. So in fact, um, I was able to check beforehand whether anything was predictive like stellar mass or stellar radius. Is there any reason why we should be incomplete in some parts of, um, these part of this particular sample because perhaps there would be transiting planets but we're less likely to see them transit because the stars are noisier, for example, more active. And so I was able to test 
um, this hypothesis based on the fact that all the stars in the sample possess published near-infrared and optical spectra, including some that I published myself. This is showing Kepler-61. So in addition to having all of these spectra, 91 of the 109 host stars have measured rotation periods and amplitudes by Amy McQuillan from the Kepler light curves themselves. Because stars have star spots and rotate in some coherent fashion, you'll see the star's brightness appear sort of like a sinusoid as spots rotate in and out of view. This enables you to infer the star's rotation period, the amplitude coverage. So I could test for free whether one sample of planets, those hosting multiply, those in multiply transiting systems and those in singly transiting systems are different as a function of the stellar rotation period and amplitude, which correspond with stellar youth. As stars grow older, they spin more slowly and show less spots. With their galactic height, so I know the position of the star in the sky very well, and if I know its distance, then I can infer the amount it must reside above the plane of the Milky Way. For stars, this corresponds to age. And I also know the metallicity of the stars from the array of near-infrared and optical spectra. So I can test whether any of these properties are predictive of the dynamical conclusion of a planetary system. So what I'm showing here on the left-hand side are histograms for these different qualities. On the right-hand side is a cumulative distribution that I use to address the question, were these populations drawn from the same parent population or from different populations? What I'm showing are results that are intriguing but only marginal. Stellar rotation period is modestly distinct one population from the other, where stars hosting multiply transiting planets are rotating more quickly. Rotation amplitude is really indistinguishable. Height above galactic midplane, again, is modestly predictive, where stars hosting multiply transiting planets are closer to the midplane. And metallicity. There's also weak evidence, weak but significant evidence, that stars that host multiply transiting planets are metal poor. So these, this paints sort of a consistent picture. It's tantalizing, but only with 95% confidence that the multiplistic coplanar systems reside around more rapidly rotating stars, which are closer to the midplane. Both of these things are, course, are um, consistent with youth in stars. They're also around more metal-poor stars. There's a correlation in uh, exoplanetary science, which is empirical in nature, which has to do with metal content of the star and the size of the planets that it, that it forms. So one might infer from that that metal poor stars are less likely to form the larger gas giant planets which would disrupt a quiescent disk of small compact coplanar planets. But this is a question I'm still actively answering um, with a graduate student from Yale, John Moriarty, who's present here at the University of Washington, whose um, experience and research is largely with n-body simulations. So we're exploring the dynamical stability of compact m-dwarf planetary systems. There was a paper very recently out by Pu and Wu on the spacing of Kepler planets. I just wanted to emphasize what they found to be true, which is what one might predict based on the fact that the multiply transiting systems appear to orbit younger stars. You might infer from that that if you leave a planetary system around an M-dwarf, which is very compact for billions of years, over time it self-disrupts. And what they found was that in roughly 50-50 measure, if you wait a billion years, um, half of complex system, compact systems orbiting uh, stars will self-disrupt due to secular interactions between adjacent planets. So it's the equivalent of asserting that there's an hourglass associated with systems of small planets orbiting M-dwarfs. When you turn the hourglass over, life might be expected to evolve on a short enough time scale, still billions of years, before that system will um, self-excite. So why should this be interesting when it comes to the remote detection of life? For the smallest stars, there's a very strong link between the dynamical nature of the system and whether or not it could support life. So to sort of guide you through how we might detect life remotely, this is showing a real spectrum of a planet which is close to us, namely Titan, the moon of Saturn. So on the x-axis is showing wavelength, 
and the y-axis is showing the relative size of the planet. So if you observe the planet at certain wavelengths, it appears larger than if you observe it at other wavelengths. This is because atmospheres of planets preferentially allow some light to filter through, depending on their constituent molecules, and absorb light in some wavelengths. If the atmosphere is very rich in a particular molecule, then that will appear, the planet will appear larger because the atmosphere is optically thick, whereas if the atmosphere is transparent at those wavelengths, the planet will appear smaller. This is something for which um, we've deduced from Titan that it's very rich in methane. There must be a haze on the atmosphere of Titan, which enables us to conclude something about the relative size of particulates in the Titanian atmosphere. But we've never done this yet for a rocky planet orbiting another star. We have done so-called transit transmission spectroscopy for planets orbiting other stars, but these are all larger than Earth size. The figure I'm showing here is a mock-up for what will ultimately be possible with the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2018. So this is showing after integrating for 28 hours during transit on a particular planet, you can see with signal to noise of a few that that planet looks different sizes at different wavelengths corresponding to features in its atmosphere of water and CO2. This is the um, way that I think most exoplanets uh, exoplaneteers would assert um, is going to be the most fruitful for the remote detection of life, so-called transmission spectroscopy. So again, this is an instrument which is not in existence yet and would require 28 hours of fixing its gaze on one planetary system. I want to impress upon you how expensive these observations will be and how much risk assessment will bear upon future observations of planetary atmospheres. This is from a paper highlighting how many hours would be required to characterize the atmosphere of a transiting Earth-sized planet using a space-based platform. That 6.5 meter space-based telescope is referring to the James Webb Space Telescope. If you have the advantage of that planet transiting a smaller star, then with 200 hours you could pull out features with, like CO2 or like water which correspond to habitability although they're not unique signatures of life and yet the time baseline that's required is very long. Crucially you can only observe the light filtered through the planetary atmosphere when the planet is transiting. You have to wait for that planet to transit. With M stars, with low mass stars, the habitable zone resides much closer into the host star so those transits are more frequent. And yet even around a small star, we're talking about an investment of five years to characterize the atmosphere of even a single planet. This is why we have to be very calculating about which planets deserve that very expensive space telescope time. And I'm arguing from this and other work that there are features that r relatively inexpensible observables which are predictive of the dynamical history of a planetary system. But why should that matter for the atmosphere? Why should that matter for habitability? The reason is because if you have more planets, the system tends to be dynamically quieter. So this is showing from radial velocity detections of planets. So these are mass measured planets um, for which we've seen the reflex motion of the host star. You can see if the system has more planets, the average eccentricity of planetary systems is less. You have more circular orbits. This is work by Marianne Limbach uh, at Princeton University. Um, so how are we going to find these planets? Um, what's most interesting, uh, probably in the future of planets in the next couple years, will be the launch of the TESS uh, mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This is going to be looking not at a single um, field in the sky, uh, where stars are located on average hundreds of light years away, it's going to be surveying the nearest stars. What we know now from Kepler is that those planets must be there, and so this is a mission which is surveying them, looking for those planets, which surely must be nearby based on the yield from Kepler. Fixing its gaze on the nearest stars. I'm showing again these nearby M dwarfs around which we infer there must be an Earth-sized planet residing in its star's habitable zone. Um, I'll emphasize why 
particular types of stars are going to be most promising and why we need tests for them. So this is a parameter space of possible planets as a function of the radius of the planet, the type of star where small stars are more toward the viewer in this cube and larger stars are more away from the viewer and the z-axis is showing the brightness where really bright stars are toward the top of the cube and dim stars are toward the bottom of the cube. Discovered planets are sort of the dots which are already shown there um, from Kepler, from a ground-based survey called MIRTH and from CORO, uh, a space-based platform um, from the European Space Agency. So we want those planets to be bright. We want those stars, pardon me, to be bright so that we can gather the most possible photons of the planet in transit. We want that planet to be rocky. What we know now from Kepler is that planets which are one and a half size the radius of the Earth and larger tend to have large gaseous envelopes, less habitable than we imagine um, a rocky planet would be. And we need a favorable planet to star radius ratio. We need that ring of atmosphere to fractionally be a, a much larger size of the signal cast again, so a shadow cast on a much smaller star. So there's a golden part of parameter space in which we really need planets and TESS is going to uncover these. So what I'm showing on the left hand side again is planets we found before. The blue dots uh, in contrast on the right hand side are showing the planets we are going to uncover with TESS. Where only a handful of Kepler planets met these criteria and are amenable to atmospheric follow-up, dozens of TESS planets will be amenable to follow-up and some of these planets will be orbiting naked eye stars. There's already one star that you can take your child or niece or nephew or grandchild and point at in the night sky and say we know that there's a transiting planet around that star with tests um, those planets will increase in number. So in conclusion uh, I wanted to remind you that Kepler multiples inform our understanding of the true number of planets per star and their inclinations. A picture is emerging that there's a bimodal distribution of planetary systems where stars hosting two or more planets, two or more transiting planets can be explained with a single model and that model looks a lot like the solar system but there are too many singly transiting planets to be consistent with this and this is robust to possible selection effects. We have to invoke a mixture model so each of these models occurs about 50% of the time from a ratio of the Bayesian evidences. We know that this hypothesis is favored by 21 to 1. We find that some properties of the stars are modestly predictive, but those results are only intriguing at present. And the big picture is setting ourselves up for the highest exoplanet science return for James Webb. Thank you so much for your time. I guess I'll leave it there. Wow, that's incredible. It's cool, right? Oh my goodness, it's like drinking from a fire hose. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. I love speaking about it because it's a super interesting result. Fantastic. Do we have any questions from the audience? John. Yes. Um, hey, Dr. Ballard, could you switch over uh, from the screen share over to your uh, video? Yes. I'd be happy to do that. Yes. Cool, there you are. All right. Yeah. John, what's your question? <laughs> okay, so you're talking about um, watching the brightness change as the planets go by to see if there are planets on it. Yeah. Uh, if, the plane of, uh, if the plane for which the uh, planets are moving is shifted and you can't see that, do you guys observe or can you observe the uh, oscillations of the star to see if there's some kind of... Uh, and forgive me if I get it wrong, some kind of wave function to describe the, how many planets are and how they interact with it? Um, so you're asking about whether you might detect a planet which does not transit, so it's in such an orientation that it, it's not in the plane of Earth, you know, whether or not it transits, um, but it might still be detected based on its imprint on its star. Yes. That, yeah, yeah. Okay, so with... Um, with radial velocity, you can do that. So namely, the way that planets are detected with that other method is looking for the Doppler shift in the spectrum. So the star moving toward or away from the viewer, the, star, the planet doesn't have to be perfectly coplanar for some, for some projection of that vector to be in the plane of the viewer, so that you're actually seeing 
a Doppler shift of the star. So the star is slightly changing in color, redder when the planet is tugging it away from the viewer, and blue when the planet is tugging it closer. As far as whether a transiting planet imprints itself on the photometry of the star, that, that has actually been seen. So it's only been seen for highly eccentric Jupiter planets, where you have the planet in an eccentricity where it swings very close to the host star only once very rarely, and it does induce a set of pulsations which look like an overdamped oscillator. So that you see that it excites some modes in the star, but those damp out as the, as the planet moves away from the star. So, but that's the only way in which, the only ways in which I know you see with a transit method the imprint of a planet on the host star, other than the planet transiting. And now is that just because our sensors aren't uh, precise enough, or do you think maybe they'll become more precise and become a new, more common method? Um, so I think that the question really is one of what ultimately will be the limiting factor, and that's really stellar activity. So it's very, very hard to infer that some pulsation that you're seeing is due to a planet when you don't a priori know that the planet is there. So stars are already pulsating at, you know, um, for, the, for the sun, we know that there are thousands of um, resonant frequencies associated with the sun at angular modes, so it's all the spherical harmonics at angular modes, you know, up to 30. And so for, for planets that we observe only as a single pixel, and we're deducing their resonant frequencies only from the brightness, you know, we've seen uh, something like 30 modes that you can individually detect, and these have a very different characteristic time scale. So it, it would be very hard to disentangle whether the pulsation from a star was due to the intrinsic star itself or due from a planet. You might be able to determine something again from the time signature, but your ability to really infer whether it was due to a planet or something else, it's probably not the most fruitful way to look for planets, even though it might be possible. Just because like the false positive thing would, would be weighing on you so heavily. Okay. Any other questions we're going to ask? I have one, but she answered it during <laughs> <laughs> Lucas. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that we, we like planets that are in uh, the same plane opening around the solar star, right? But then yeah. the study by the two scientists said that if they are too close in the same plane, then they could self disrupt. Yeah. How, how is it that they self disrupt when they're in the same plane? Yeah, right. Um, so. How is it that they self-disrupt? I think, so from reading that paper, I'm not a dynamicist, so I'm only reporting on what I read. You can have the accumulation of secular effects. So even though you have a very small projection angle between the orbital uh, planes of the two planets, you can kind of self-excite. Um, and the mechanism for doing that apparently takes giga years in order to actually get planetary ejections. So surely that time scale says something about the excitation mechanism, but exactly what it is, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, but yeah, uh, it's possible. Uh, uh, going off of Lucas's question there, uh, what was the author's or the link or something to that paper? Is that something that might be accessible? Oh yeah. At an undergraduate level, or is it is it really 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 high end that might be too difficult to kind of look at? Um. That paper is very dense, um, so that, uh, you know, I digested it in small chunks uh, myself, um, which doesn't mean that the overall message isn't really interesting. Um, so what I might want to point folks to is like a summary of it. So I found I wanted to show, for example, like a really interesting figure from that paper but all of the figures would have required, you know, minutes of explanation about what the axes meant and so on. So I think it would be a paper that was very rewarding to kind of a devoted read, um, but to just, like, have a passing glance, I think it would be difficult to parse. Okay. Yeah, but I could still send you the link. That would be great. Has, has the uh, Astrobytes um, blog covered it? I don't know. I need to look it up. So I kind of tweeted it. You know, okay. series of maybe ten tweets or something, but I mean that's not as meaty as Astrobytes. Um, I was going to Google it right now, but I don't want you to see me Googling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you would shoot me the link to it maybe later, if you uh, remember, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so you mentioned running like 
numerical universes. Yeah. Uh, and so I was kind of curious, how long do those run? Do you run them sort of um, oh, like overnight, or is it like days, weeks long? How, how long do those, those codes run uh, when you're doing your ensemble? So I don't model the planetary systems forward or backward in time. Um, I only generate planetary systems at some arbitrary sort of uh, angle with respect to the viewer. Okay. Um, so I draw planets in a Monte Carlo fashion from like an orbital period distribution, so like a spacing from the star distribution um, as, the, as a function of the number of planets and their mutual inclination, and then I pick randomly on the celestial sphere an angle for which to view that system and ask, does the orbit of this planet correspond at any point with the star? Right. You know, would it ever transit if you looked at it? So namely, what is the impact parameter of this planet in this orbit? And then I, and so this is, so I didn't evolve the systems forward or backwards in time. I just sort of manufactured systems at one snapshot and then asked, would this ever transit? Um, so that involved, uh, I don't think that it ran overnight. Um, the simulation that I used eccentric planets for took a lot longer because I was having to integrate Kepler's laws of motion just to know, you know, the distance of the host star um, as a function, the distance from the host star uh, as a function of eccentricity. But they were things that, you know, I probably ran them one time. I think they took an hour or something. You know, I was like manufacturing a million planetary systems and then storing them in ASCII files, mm -hmm. you know, and like the number of systems that transit per star. Um, so that was kind of the nature of it. It wasn't like an N-body integrator, you right. know, okay. user. Yeah. I, I seem to recall in reading your, your paper that mm -hmm. that for some of them you checked whether they were whether the system was stable. Right, right. So 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 kind of how do you do that? Right. So you generate this this, this model system. Mm -hmm. You check to see okay, would I have any transients, and then you check to see okay, is this a system that's going to stay? Right. Right. So I can't <laughs> kind of, I, it's complicated to address whether the system is long-term stable. So that's what this group uh, at, partially at the University of Toronto did, was with a, a series of very sophisticated numerical simulations. What I did was a very simplistic approximation of that related to hill stability. You know, so like, are these planets going to pass close enough toward one another that they could disrupt one another, like, ah, on a very scale? Okay. Okay. You know, Okay. Um, and that was based on, I, it was based on almost like an empirical result um, from one of Dan Fabricy's papers. So there's kind of like the basic hill stability criterion for like two bodies, and then there's the question if you have a number of bodies in a row, is there some kind of mutual hill stability criterion? And that, there was one, and he had kind of worked out what it, what it seemed to need to be based on the systems of transiting planets that they had observed. So what, whatever evolved and stayed in its pristine state in, co in a coplanar fashion um, were separated by such and such an amount. So presumably if they were separated then less than that, um, then they wouldn't have survived. Right. So I, I sort of used his like empirical guide for spacing planets, and if they were more closely spaced than that, then I said the system isn't viable. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any other questions here? So I know the question that's burning on our minds is, uh, what, what did you use to, what computer program did you use to write the code? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about this myself. Um, I have been coding for 10 years in IDL. Isn't that shameful? <laughs> Isn't that shameful? I've just started writing in Python. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just made the switch over to Python. If only because there's so many great statistical packages in Python. You know, right. I couldn't hold out for longer. Right. Yeah. Well, well, kind of leapfrogging off of that, uh, we've been really pushing more and more computation at the undergraduate level, integrating uh, uh, yeah. in a computation into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. What sort of advice would you give, you know, undergraduates uh, coming from your own perspective where you're at and what you're doing uh, that you would have for undergraduates? What sort of advice might you have? Uh, as far as like things they might do computing wise or otherwise both both um, so computing wise I think uh, the best thing that one could do is to start playing so um, I say that 
not only because it's intuitively true that if you have something that's interesting to you and you're curious about how to solve it, um, you're, more, you're likelier to do it. I also think that when people are bringing creativity to a problem, um, it's enjoyable, they're just likelier to keep at it. So one thing I do uh, with undergrads who are interested in doing research with me, for example, is I say, is I try to give an interesting challenge. So I'll say, if you have a camera, um, set it up on a tripod at a busy intersection and take a series of images. And then I want you to read those images into a computer and produce a frame in which you can see no cars at all. Mm. And so one could do that with a stack of images of the same place and then a median filter. Right. You know, but that but the end result is very is kind of mysterious, you know, and, and kind of beautiful in its own way. That like you were able to produce uh, an image where there was none physically. Um, and so that involves like a number of skills. It kind of involves um, reading images into a computer, writing a for loop, you know, and understanding median filters. Um, another thing that I would have students do is try to write your own MCMC code from scratch. So just try to fit a line to some data and uh, determine the good parameters of that line based on demanding that in this random walk you take, some fraction of them improve the fit and some fraction don't improve the fit. And then you can look at the nature of the jumps that you took in this kind of Brownian motion sense to see what the parameters are. Um, I say that because the easiest thing to teach at the undergraduate level and the thing that I learned at the undergraduate level was like fitting chi-squared grids. Mm -hmm. um, and so like trying to fit a model in a frequentist sense and, and that's, that's almost never used in practice. So even if you use it, um, so I would say like try to you know use this like Markov chain Monte Carlo method and then um, probably use Python. You know like if I could start now, I would say use Python. Okay, well we've definitely been trying to push use of Python in, in all of our courses, and I I have to admit that the students are kind of laughing. They had me last semester for a um, uh, the statistics and data analysis error analysis type class. Mm -hmm. And you know, we definitely did, you know, the chi-squared fits. Yes. But I, I see that you're right. We probably need to do more with uh, Monte Carlo and some of the other more practically applied tools. I know, but it's very tempting because chi-squared is so intuitively understandable. Right. And I think that, um, I mean, I only very recently have done um, like empirical Bayesian analysis. This was my first foray into it. I actually picked this project because I wanted to kind of force myself to try to understand it. Um, I ended up actually taking time. I went to uh, Harvard to visit my collaborator on this work, and he had taught a class, like a, an undergraduate level class on Bayesian statistics, and I worked through his homeworks. You know, I have a very hard time just kind of being an autodidact and learning from textbooks, that's never something that's come very naturally to me, even though I know it comes naturally to others. I really need to kind of make mistakes and then try to talk to a person about why it's wrong. And so um, I find that I found that really helpful, but it was a much bigger uh, investment than like thinking about chi-squared, you know, which is why I think it's actually still a really good place to start. But it can be frustrating um, ultimately because you have this code written and you learned how to do it, and then your problem has like many more dimensions right. you know, so that you can't really explore it in a chi-squared grid or your parameter space, the fits end up being like multimodal, you know, mm -hmm. so you like different chunks of parameter space and so you have to ask yourself, am I exploring this coarse chi-squared grid um, finely enough, you right. know, and, and those questions are um, uh, much more readily answered with like an MCMC chain. So I would say like it's maybe cool to start with both. Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, Python seems like the way to go. I don't know, wave of the future, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's check the, uh, the Twitter hashtag to make sure we haven't missed a question. Checking it? Uh, yeah, I don't. I think I've hammered the hashtag with um, tweets. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, thank you for live tweeting. I promised I was paying attention. <laughs> I want to say that I don't know. If, I don't know if you know this or not, but because um, uh, I saw your work was like Poisson uh, distribution uh, probability. Um, I think there's a package out 
that I've seen recently that is uh, basically it's R integrated into Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Which would make life a lot easier. <laughs> I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I mean, that's part of what motivated me to start using Python was to use Multinest, um, which is uh, kind of like a multimodal evidence calculator for Bayesian statistics. Because if you're doing model comparison, it's really hard to think about doing it with the chi-squared. Like, OK, so my reduced chi-squared is 1 for this model, and then it's like 2 for this other model. So how much better is one than the other? I mean, that's very, it's not like intuitive. Whereas with Bayesian evidences, you can address immediately, like, how, more, how much more likely is this model than the other model? But then there's that question of knowing whether you're exploring sufficient parameter space. So um, with this kind of, like, enclosed methodology where, like, they, this um, multi-nest, like, starts from the cube of possible parameter space and then, like, with different polygons, like, kind of zooms in on the most probabilistic part of parameter space so it knows it's kind of from the top down what the evidence is and enables you to compare them. This is like a beautiful tool. And I wanted so badly to be able to use it, but it was only in Python. <laughs> so this is why I like, forced myself to learn it. It's absolutely worthwhile. Cool. I think, I think we have a new, new project. we got to learn that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you mentioned working with undergrads. Do, do you have any uh, REU? Uh, programs that are running there in your uh, research group? So I know that the University of Washington Physics has an REU. Okay. Um, so I think that those students tend to associate more with the physics department. The state of Washington actually has NASA funding so that if you apply, you, you can apply for summer research budget to work with an undergraduate. The undergraduates that I work with have all been pro bono. I, <laughs> I, pay them, I pay for them to go to conferences, you know, and I, and I um, pay for them to stay cool places and present their work. But um, I haven't identified salaries for them. So this is kind of the first year that I've been applying to grants specifically to fund students. Um, actually, much more through, through NASA than through NSF, which funds the REU program. Right. Does uh, UCA have an REU program? We do not, but we send a lot of our students out to other institutions. Yeah, that happens at Washington, too. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, it's great to get away and to see another institution and get to meet new people. So it's good opportunities. Yeah, my student this year, I had a student who was um, looking for Trojan asteroids. So it's like a very low pose problem, um, looking for transiting asteroids. And he is going to an RU in the Netherlands. So he's like really. Oh, wow. Nice. That's awesome. He's really in the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was really proud of him. <laughs> wow. Um, anything else we have? We can ask so, a uh, oh, okay. couple of us are going to be going on to grad school next year uh, from the undergrad. What, what was your experience like bouncing from undergraduate to grad school and, and knowing where you wanted to go and what you wanted to do? Because um, it's kind of been confusing to try and drive wreck for a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I remember that period of time as being really fraught with uncertainty and anxiety. You're probably feeling some of that. Um, a lot of it for me was wrapped up in the physics GRE. Like, I remember being absolutely terrified of the physics GRE. Um, and it's kind of really unclear what to expect, especially because if you've been a student for your whole life, um, which is often the case for folks who are going to graduate school, it's sort of the first time that you're transitioning out of that structure. Um, so what I found was that, um, I mean, I could give a lot of really specific pieces of advice, but pieces of advice that always apply are that it just, everything takes a while, you know, so that, like, it might be that you don't feel ready to go, or you might be, like, kind of afraid that if I go... I don't know that I'll eventually learn how to think of my own projects and how to implement them and identify the resources I need. And all of that will just come with time. Like, it's, it's not a thing that people are either born physicists or they're not physicists. Like, that's, that's really an illusion. Um, that's demonstrably so, that people learn uh, more if they have kind of a mindset where you, things just take time and hard work and then you learn. So I say that because I was plagued with a lot of feelings of like unworthiness, you know, applying to graduate school and I was really unsure of whether I could do it. I started out in gender studies at Berkeley in peace and conflict studies. So if I could do it, you know, that was a big transition. Um, 
and, uh, and I think there's also kind of like a lot of anxiety that happens because it's so uncertain. Um, and indeed, graduate school, when you go, will be very different. It's different. So I kind of identified four ways in which um, I thought that support structures were kind of lacking, and then I kind of made a structure to help me with that. Um, I published this in an article that's called, um, oh, I forget, two astronomers named Sarah something something. Um, so uh, it's different from undergrad, first, because there's not really short-term rewards in the same way. So like as an undergrad, you can you have like a problem set that's due, and then it's due in a week, and then it's done, right? And then you get feedback on whether you did it right or not, or with tests and so on. And with graduate school, the landmarks are still there, but they're much there's much more space between them. You're not getting as much feedback. Um, there's not really a, an incentive to really have like work life balance, you know, especially because in academic culture, there's this feeling that you're always supposed to be working, and I think that's not really reasonable and that's not really healthy. And there's this feeling that other people are working way more hours than you are, even though they're not. So in this article, I point, I point to um, statistics from the Bureau of Labor um, that shows that people who say that they work 80 hours a week are actually working 40 hours a week, like on average. Um, and so I developed this system with my friend, another graduate student, where we actually check in with each other. So. Um, we so whenever we do like a certain amount of work, like a 30-minute block of work, we put it in a Google sheet, <laughs> and so and we with like a little note, so that we see how much one another is working, and we don't feel like everyone's working way more than we are. Um, and we I also feel like I'm checking in with a person because a lot of the work can be way more solitary. And we reward ourselves periodically. Like if you did X amount of work, like you just get a reward. Um, and so we kind of like develop the structure to sort of navigate it because academia is like is super weird um, in a lot of ways and really different from um, from being a student like navigating academia. But that doesn't mean that I that it's not possible. It's just that you kind of have to take um, one's well-being into one's own hands in a way that you kind of didn't have to when you were a student. Um, so that kind of answers sort of a broader question as far as like more detailed questions about like personal statement or um, you know trying to identify a research project and stuff like that um, maybe I can answer those like with email or Twitter maybe because I don't want to take up so much of your time yeah okay fantastic yeah I appreciate it thanks that's, that's actually a lot better than I was expecting I was just like man you know it's a lot of general advice that applies to a lot of different, different situations I know so I can be yeah yeah right <laughs> So could, could you maybe speak a little bit about what your transition was from uh, science and maybe in your high school mm -hmm. to then going to um, Berkeley? Yeah. And then how you transitioned to physics and then from there into graduate school? Sort of what, sure. what was that thought process for you? Um, so in high school, uh, I was actually talking a lot with Amy about this recently <laughs> with middle school year. Um, I wasn't really that into science. Um, I found math very satisfying, mm -hmm. but I liked, um, I really liked English like a lot better. For whatever reason, I had identified this as being a thing that I wanted to do, even though I found math, like I say, like satisfying is a really good word for it. Whatever reason, I found it very satisfying. Um, so I went to college and I thought I was going to study, I don't know, I thought maybe I'd be a social worker, was something I was thinking about. Um, and I took an astronomy class to fulfill what I thought at the time was a stupid physical science breath requirement. <laughs> <laughs> I really did not want to take it. And yet um, I found myself going to every office hour and like actually looking forward to doing my homework. It's kind of like, you know, I have like a fresh-faced aspect that now when I see like undergrads, it's like, oh, God, because they're so excitable. <laughs> I'm kind of like an embittered old postdoc. So I had like a very ex excited feeling, and um, it ends up being, so I'll quote the National Academy of Sciences report, Beyond Bias and Barriers. Um, there's very different reasons why people tend to pursue science as a function of gender. So if you ask people, why did you pursue graduate education in the hard sciences? Um, 
men will often say it's because I felt that I was very capable um, or because I thought I could make a contribution. And, um, and women don't tend to self-report that. They tend to say, I pursued a graduate career in hard science because somebody encouraged me to. Um, whether it was kind of a, like a trusted friend, so not even like a teacher, um, kind of a person who was close to them. And that's my own story. So at the end of that astronomy talk, I asked the um, advisor, the university advisor that I was assigned to, I asked the professor and I asked the TA, do you think that this is something I could do? Um, and all three of them said, you absolutely should do it. Like this is, I think you've identified the thing that you should do. Wow. And I think there, but for the grace of those three people, go I. Yeah. You know, um, and then sort of at every stage it's been like that, where then a professor at Berkeley said, are you applying to graduate school? You should apply to graduate school. Um, and then at, once I was at Harvard, my graduate advisor had the expectation that I would be a postdoc. I mean, there's part of that that's kind of academia and it's insular nature. Like people think that if you start an academic, you should end an academic, and that's kind of silly in a way. Um, but for better or for worse, I received that um, encouragement, and that's been the most important thing. Even though I love it, um, and I find the topic very fulfilling, I was saying earlier uh, to Amy that if I feel lonely or um, solitary too much, it, astronomy won't be exciting to me. And so a lot of it has been kind of like also trying to find a balance um, between doing the work I love and also like having a life. Um, and I think it's really silly, like in a lot of science culture, there's sort of the feeling that like you're just supposed to work all the time and that makes a person a better scientist. And I, I don't know that that's true. You know, I think, um, I think it's, it's demonstrably so that people are most creative and ideas in groups especially emerge when um, discussions are proceeding equitably, like everyone in the group is participating. I reviewed this in another article that I wrote. It was an article in science about how groups um, best function. And um, I just feel like science is a lot more about interpersonal uh, relationships than we kind of give it credit for. So I've tried to sort of shoehorn that into my own scientific career. Um, so it's been both. But it's a lot of like work-life balance. Yeah, that's a hard thing to, to get your head around. And, and as undergrads, we don't do a good job of trying to foster that. Because <laughs> we, do, we do shovel it on you pretty hard. And yeah, that's... I remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely remember that. Um, we try, uh, so the physics club um, has a pretty strong core group of uh, folks that look out for one another, and, and there's a lot of goofing off, I think, that goes on. And the club <laughs> later on at night, fueled by pizza and Coke. Uh, but, but we found that that community is really helpful to help people who might be struggling either with the classes or with their own sense of do I belong here. And so yeah. get into a group of people that, that support you and help, help you as a person. That, to me, is like you know, the golden rule. I was, I was very moved when I visited uh, Vanderbilt recently. Mm -hmm. They have a bridge program in, in astronomy and physics there, and I think also now chemistry and biology, where there's a local uh, in Nashville historically black college. Mm -hmm. So historically black colleges have produced all of the black women astronomers. Right. You know. Um, so, there, and programs like this have produced, like, the only Hubble fellow who's a black woman came from this exact program at Vanderbilt. Um, so there's a very uh, different way that they function, where they create kind of a cohort of students, and I uh, sat in on one of these meetings. So I went with the professor who organizes it to the historically black college called Fisk, mm -hmm. and observed kind of an academic planning meeting. And it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Like, the group of students were sitting there and trying to plan their courses together, and one was saying, I really like this plan. Nobody gets left behind. Oh, wow. And I had n I've never heard that articulated in a group of physicists before. Like, the implication, especially in more old-school physicists, is, like, if you get left behind, so much the better. And right. this is an attitude which is... Um, which ends up being very exclusionary to folks, but I'm not convinced that it's a helpful one even for people for whom that feels second nature. Right. Um, so I think that, and here at the University of Washington, we have a program called the Pre-Major in Astronomy program, where you kind of have a cohort of freshmen who immediately get involved sort of in research projects, and they have homework groups, and this has really 
tripled the number of women and people of color um, take their attention. So groups are where it's at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This the audience you see here uh, doesn't have any of our female uh, physics majors. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday night is uh, not our usual night for the seminars, and so on Tuesdays the class schedules work out a little bit better than some of those students are able to attend. But cool. you know, it's it's right that it takes a while for uh, enough people to be in the club or be in the major that when they look in the room they see people like them and hence want to participate and be in that room. So we're getting we're getting better with uh, our undergraduate uh, female students, but we have a long way to go with our underrepresented minorities. We've got we got a lot of work to do, but we're focused on it. That, yeah, that's definitely how it is in astronomy. You sound very well versed in it yourself. Um, I'm convinced that a few people can make a very big difference. Like, exoplanets, for whatever reason, uh, is very well populated with women scientists, and most of these women were advised at one point or another by one of two men. Um, and these are, so, I mean, that's just two individuals who kind of single-handedly changed the profile of exoplaneteer because of uh, positive mentoring, you know, and that, uh, you know, and that was kind of like a snowball effect. Um, in a way, but I'm convinced that individual people can make a really big difference. Wow. Are, are you on a, a tenure track there at University of Washington, or are you...? I wish. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, this was my first year applying to professor jobs. Um, I So I applied to 10. I got on a few short lists. Um, so it was my first time trying to interview for them. That was really different. Yeah. And um, I don't know what will come of them yet. Uh, I have a job this fall. So my Sagan fellowship is done at the end of August. Like I need to get out of my office and et cetera. I have a fellowship at MIT for four years. Um, that all, so I'll be going there. Wow. Okay. Wow. Well, wherever you end up, they're going to be very lucky to have you. So this Thank you for saying that. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, this seminar is has been fantastic. You you really have a knack for communicating at the undergraduate level for this audience, and I'm sure I'd love to be able to, to see a seminar that you give at you know, a, a graduate talk or uh, at, a, at a conference some, sometime. That would be just amazing to see. But you really know how to, to talk to your audience, so we really appreciate your time. Um, that's and, uh, you, you've done a great, a great thing for us, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to give us a talk. You're so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, do we have any other questions before we let our speaker go? <laughs> no? All right, let's give it one more round. <laughs> All right, so I'll send you an email later on. Oops. She just canceled the call. Oops. <laughs> All right, that was a good idea. Okay.